Hey guys, it's me, Allie, again. Um, this is a continuation on my video lectures for neonatal ventilation and um, equipment management. This, again, will also be a lecture reviewing theory and equipment management, as I just said. Um, it is aimed towards respiratory students, RTs aim that are new in the newborn ICU, and new newborn ICU nurses. So down there is me. This one, this video um, lecture is specifically for high frequency jet ventilation. That And this one might end up being my longest, most lengthiest. So here we go guys. It's gonna be great. Okay. The outline. I kind of like to just kind of give you a clue of what we're going to talk about on this lecture. So we're going to start off by indications and pathologies, the actual theory and physics behind the jet ventilator and what makes it different, the different components to the jet high frequency jet ventilator, settings and ranges, equipment management, and then what I honestly think is the most important is troubleshooting. So as you can see here to the right, I have a picture a full picture of the high frequency jet ventilator. Um, I have, and you can see what essentially we're doing is we're running two ventilators at the same time. We have a conventional ventilator, which in these presentations you might see it as a CV, conventional ventilator, and then the high frequency jet ventilator below, which is managed and manufactured by Vanel. So why and what is the jet? Um, this is a, so I'll just read it to start out. The high frequency jet ventilator is a neonatal specialty ventilator that ventilates using high frequency strategies. So essentially, similar to the oscillator, we are using itty bitty tidal volumes, little itty bitty breaths that are less than one mil per kilogram of their, like what a set normal tidal volume would be. Um, high rate, we're using peep and mean to maintain our airways open so that we can have appropriate oxygenation and recruit alveolar recruitment. And then this one just has a little bit different strategies, but same theory that high, high rates. Um, one thing with the jet is it allows for passive exhalation, which can be improved benefits for certain pathologies such as air leaks that might come from say too small of tube or um, a pneumothorax, anything like that. And also just for premature lungs, PIE is a huge indicator for the jet. I like to think of the jet as gentle and powerful at the same time. And one thing to be aware of the jet ventilator, um, if you want things to be fast, use the oscillator. If you want things to work over a long period of time, it's the jet. So the analogy I like to think if you want a relationship that burns hot real fast, the oscillator. If you want a commitment that is a good, healthy relationship, think of it as a marriage. Think of the jet. It takes time to see benefits, but it's good benefits when you see them. I might be a little biased, but this is one of my favorite ventilators I'm telling you guys about. Indications and pathologies. Um, that passive exhalation we talked about where the high frequency oscillatory ventilator, that piston moves back and forth. So we have active inhalation, active exhalation, active inhalation, active exhalation, because it's moving back and forth. Because of some of the strategies on the jet, we have that passive exhalation, which is great for um, air leaks, such as pneumothoraces, ET tube compensation, PIE, um, which is premature interstitial emphysema. Meconium aspiration, any type of airway clearance, the jet is excellent for. So as most commonly situations we see airway clearance needs are meconium aspiration in neonates. Prematurity, excellent piece of equipment for protecting the lungs. Respiratory distress syndrome, yeah, it still is just a high frequency ventilator. It works great for that. Oh, pulmonary interstitial emphysema, sorry, excuse me, I said prematurity. And then it helps decrease the risk of barotrauma and volume trauma that can come from delivering positive pressure ventilation to 
stiff, non-compliant, and itty bitty baby lungs that are just underdeveloped. Okay, so theory. So the high frequency jet ventilator is bene ben beneficial to underdeveloped neonatal lungs by maintaining accurate ventilation and decreasing the risk of barotrauma and volume trauma. Essentially, it is a gentle form of positive pressure ventilation for immature alveoli. We, one thing that can cause PIE in newborns is we give that positive pressure and we overstretch those alveoli. They become stretched out, they become floppy. Um, it's not the most accurate of analogies. I mean, not accurate, appropriate of analogies, but essentially we're taking these little itty bitty underdeveloped alveoli that we want to open up and close like a water balloon. They're small, they're stiff, but they're compliant. They maintain the same shape. They stay in that little tiny water balloon size and shape. What happens when we give positive pressure onto those little alveoli is um, with larger volumes, they start to stretch out because we're trying to make space for those little underdeveloped alveoli. So they begin to stretch out. So instead of having little alveoli that are little water balloons, we end up having big floppy condom alveoli that just kind of are saggy and hang there and they don't really maintain a shape. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of the weird visual visualization I like to give for the transition from normal alveoli to PIE or um, alveoli that can be damaged from barotrauma and volume trauma. The passive exhalation, um, also how it is given, we use measured pressures, but we give this high frequency ventilation through interrupted continuous flow. Um, so between that flow interruption and passive exhalation is what allows for this gentle ventilation. And unfortunately with gentle, um, just like I said, it can take a while. It can take a little bit of a commitment to get those lungs open, get them recruited, get ventilation, get oxygenation going. But the long-term effects are very beneficial. So three things. If you're thinking about setting up the jet, do we need to rest the lungs? Do we have just premature lungs that we need to rest and let grow and let this baby kind of develop a little bit more? Do we need to clean the lungs? Um, do we have meconium aspiration? Do we have some type of weird pneumonia? Do we have consolidations for some reason? Think meconium aspiration. Um, or do we need to protect the lungs? Are they damaged in some way that we need to protect them while this baby heals and while they get better? Do we need to protect them from further damage or complications? So do we need to rest, clean, or protect the lungs? High frequency jet ventilation gas delivery. So what makes this delivery specific is what's called transitional flow. Um, in every other form of positive pressure ventilation that we're delivering, conventional, high frequency, non-invasive, all that, we are aiming for laminar flow, which is essentially flow that is discontinuous and smooth and like a river or a stream of water going. Turbulent flow is what happens when there might be an obstruction, maybe going on our river example, maybe there's a rock in the river and it's causing that flow to turn and churn in some way. Transitional flow is what is specific for high frequency jet ventilation. This is gas that is delivered um, at a high speed. So you can think of it as it's jetting through the lungs. It's jetting through any um, obstruction, jetting through any consolidation, through any collapse, um, collapsed alveoli, anything like that. So the middle is faster, the mid center flow is faster, while the outer flow is slower. And I have a diagram on the next slide. Um, that Benelli uses the word, it squirts to the end of the lungs, and that made me uncomfortable. So I like to think of it as it jets like a rocket to where we need to be past obstructions, consolidations, anything like that. Um, and then the passive exhalation is what helps move secretions or 
um, up and out or else is what allows for that protection and prevention of air trapping um, to occur. So this allows for deep penetration of flow, ventilation to distal airways. So again, we use it to jet because it's the jet ventilator to those distal airways that we need. Um, we flush out dead space instead of trapping. That is part of that passive exhalation. So instead of having air trapping occur where we don't fully exhale, this passive exhalation is able to move out in order to allow for air trapping to decrease and that dead space ventilation. So remember dead space is ventilation that is just hanging out. It's not part of the ventilation or perfusion or any of that gas exchange of the alveoli. It's just air that's hanging out in free space, it's dead weight air. Um, we can overcome obstructions and bring the pressure behind for removal. I get, that's why it's indicated for meconium aspiration. Um, compensation for air leaks due to transitional flow delivery because we're using that flow to basically help stent that airway open. Um, and then that passive exhalation, I'll, I have pictures that'll show you. That'll make it a little easier to understand than me talking to you. Um, because of this passive exhalation, we can tolerate lower mean airway pressures, which we don't set a mean airway pressure, but we do set a peep, which allows that um, those airways to be open and recruited. Um, so we also have lower airway, this transitional flow allows for lower airway resistance. So if there is an obstruction or structure or something along those lines and it helps move past it and then longer exhalation time. Okay, here's the diagram I promised you. So up here I have an example of transitional flow. So this is laminar flow. It's our little river just moving along nice and smooth. It, it's not turbulent. There's no rock in the river to make it go crazy. Transitional flow is the center because we're kind of siphoning it off, I guess, or um, pinching it off, however you want to say. The fast middle is fast. This is where the fastest flow is. And then it gets slower on the sides of the flow we're delivering. And this would be like a 3D model. So all around and that center would be quickly delivered and then the outside would have that slower flow. This is transitional flow. Um, and here is a very, again, I told you guys in the high frequency oscillatory one, I'm sorry about my pictures. They're just the easiest way to explain it. So here's some lungs. In that transitional flow, what's happening is we're jetting to the distal portions of the lungs, to the distal airways, going fast, jet, 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 jet. And then that slow flow on the outside and that fact that we're not pulling that breath out is that passive exhalation. So we're going nice and slow on the way out. Um, over here you can see um, the transitional flow is air leak compensation. Because we're having that faster distal jetting, we're able to stent things open. And then that passive exhalation doesn't help pull to help continue to collapse. So we maintain those airways open. Um, and then down here we have that longer exhalation allows for mucociliary clearance. So this maybe is a little chunk of meconium or a little chunk of vernix, whatever you want it to be, a little, little pneumonia, take your pick. Um, that passive exhalation moves behind it and is what helps to push it up and out of the lungs. So it's excellent for clearing out the lungs if we are in need of mucociliary clearance. So that kind of covers the um, kind of theory portion of how the jet works and why we would choose it. Next, we're going to go into the uh, components of the high frequency jet volunteer. So with the jet ventilator, you are managing two ventilators at the same exact time. You have the Benel. Um, Life Pulse High Frequency Jet Ventilator had to put the name because I have to give them credit for their equipment. Uh, this is what provides high frequency ventilation delivery. This is what gives us that high rate um, at a certain set PIP. 
And next we have a conventional ventilator. Um, you can use different types. The Draeger pairs beautifully though. Um, yes, there are cheaper options, but I, maybe I'm fancy and think that my babies are worth an extra 20 grand. <laughs> um, so what the conventional ventilator does is we put it into a non-invasive mode. This is so that we don't have the flow sensor um, at the proximal end like you would in a conventional ventilation setting. Um, because essentially you're just using it to provide peep and flow this to aid in our pulmonary recruitment. So that's why we keep it because otherwise the flow sensor would freak out. It would not like those high rates. It would freak out about pips. Um, and it would just cause the two ventilators to be desynchronous with each other. So we provide peep and flow to maintain that recruitment. It's what essentially is helping to support our mean airway pressure. Um, you can deliver sigh or backup rests. They're the same thing, but um, again, respiratory therapists can't make it easy and use the same term for the same thing. Um, but these sigh or backup rests would be delivered through the conventional ventilator. And then again, just like I said, it must be placed in non-invasive mode to prevent triggering and proper ventilator management to occur because the ventilator would just, if we were in an invasive setting, Every single one of those high frequency breaths, the if we were placed in an, an invasive mode, it would just trigger it constantly, and that would cause a lot of pulmonary damage to our babies. So here is the Benell Life Pulse high frequency jet ventilator. Those of you that have worked in ICU have already seen this, and I have slides coming up that are going to break it down. And then the Draeger, you can see up here is where I have it set in non-invasive. And then CPAP. Um, if you do decide to give backup rest, you will have to go to the setting ventilator settings. You can either click here or here to put it into that CMV mode that the Draeger has for um, bi-level or NIPV settings for um, backup rests. Okay, um, other components with the jet ventilator. We have the flow interrupter box, which is we're giving that continuous flow, and then we're interrupting to provide the high frequency breath delivery. So um, how we combine these two ventilator circuits is the jet runs through this flow interrupter box, and then it connects at a specialty port called the live port adapter. So this circuit coming from the high frequency jet ventilator runs through this box, interrupts the flow being provided for ventilation. Um, I also have pictures of these coming up. The live port adapter is designed where um, this transitional, this is where transitional flow occurs. The shape of this live port adapter is what allows this to go from laminar flow to transitional flow for that jet event. Um, we place it on the end of the ET tube. Um, you'll put it instead of the hub that might be normally there, how we remove it, because this is where we're going to attach our live port adapter, is the very, very end of the ET tube. We It's able to fit directly on there. Um, the live port adapter is also where both the conventional and high frequency jet ventilators come together. So this is the flow interrupter box. This is the circuit coming from the high frequency jet ventilator. Um, we have a purge here on this side. That's what this little piece is. You can see here. Essentially, it's just to purge additional pressure or any variability of pressure. Um, and then we come here. This is the box, flow interrupter box. Um, below it says from humidifier and then to patient. So we can see the flow will run from the ventilator to the patient. Um, over here you can see the flow interrupter piece that comes up and down for the flow interruption. This button drops the flow interrupter for when you install the circuit, this little piece of rubber circuit in here. We can put it down and then it can squeeze in there. Um, 
for ventilator management, make sure you're just moving this a little bit back and forth about every 12 hours once you shift to prevent any leaks from occurring in this tubing so that it doesn't pinch and then you have to replace the whole circuit. It's just part of appropriate management for the ventilator. Um, I'm fancy, so I have this little shelf I place outside of the isolette. Um, and here is, this is the bed. Um, you can see my circuit from my Draeger and then my um, circuit from my jet continues into the isolette to the baby. Um, some facilities will just put this into the isolette next to the baby for positioning. Um, but if you have the little shelf, which is beautiful, it works lovely, uh, make sure you put either a diaper or a burp cloth so that we don't have that plastic on metal loud harsh sound for neurodevelopment so that's quieter for the baby. And then you don't have to tape it. I like to tape it. That's just me and my paranoia of having it get bumped or knocked somehow. It's just another prevention, but then I don't tape over top here so that I can properly manage this um, circuit. Next is the live port adapter. Um, this allows for specific delivery and feedback to the ventilator and um, from the patient. So this piece goes, let's go back to the flow interrupter. Up here, oh, it's kind of hard to see, my apologies, it, um, attaches to the flow interrupter so that we get continuous feedback. And then this piece right here screws off that I'm holding, screws off and is where the end of this green tubing for the flow interruption and high frequency delivery is inserted right there so that we get reading, so we get the high frequency in and getting reading out. Um, each of these live port adapters are specific to certain ET tubes. So like this one, Sard's inverse is a 2.5 for a 2.5 size ET tube. And then you can see our laminar flow. This is where it would at we attach our specialty suction catheter, which is coming up on the next slide. And then how it siphons kind of like a funnel to allow for that faster flow in the center and slower flow along the outside for that certain transitional flow for the jet effect. Um, I know troubleshooting is later, but um, sometimes if you're just having issues, you're not getting, maybe you're getting weird feedback numbers and nothing's changed. I've just switched out my live port adapter before. Um, a big thing is sometimes humidity gets in here for your feedback and that can cause some complications. They're one of the cheaper parts of this expensive ventilator, so I it's a, appropriate to switch them out if you've had a baby on the jet for a while and you're just starting suddenly getting weird numbers. Okay, we have a specialty suction catheter for our equipment management um, that works with the jet and allows us to combine both the jet and the um, Draeger or conventional ventilator. So here's all the components. Let's start over on this slide. It just looks like a normal suction catheter until you get down here. You have three different ports here. You have the expiratory, I mean the big port that attaches directly to the live port adapter. And then you randomly have this other little hole. In this suction catheter you'll have these little pieces. They just block this middle hole and this outer hole. I'm not exactly sure why the manufacturer did that. Somebody smarter than me probably knows. Um, but I just always remember when I pull it out I can't lose my little pieces that look like life pieces. The old school game of life. Gotta make sure you because you have to make sure your life pieces are next to your life port adapter. That's just what they remind me with the little pieces. So, um, as my personal reminder, I'm just continuing on with things that help me. Um, you can see in this picture, I have inserted those little pieces right there. And then this big end is where the life port adapter attaches to. Okay. That leaves, this is the end where the endotracheal tube, we take the hub off, place that directly to the end of the endotracheal tube. 
and then we have these two ports. They will be too small for you to direct. So on your Draeger circuit, you'll take the Y piece off so you have just the two circuits loose. These are too small. So you have to, for that continuous flow and peep we're delivering, these come with the Draeger circuits. They're a specialty adapter that will come with it in the little baggie. These attach onto here and then onto the end of your circuit to allow it to fit. So I know it's a lot of pieces, but sometimes if you have the piece pictures, it helps. So in the end, this is what it will look like. The only piece missing is the green um, tubing right here that will just, it fits right in. It just connects right into it. The green tubing coming from the high frequency jet then later. Sorry, I don't have better pictures of it actually on a patient, but it was too hard to get a picture and protect um, patient privacy. But that's how the completed will look. And then your um, Draeger tubing, your inhalation and exhalation will connect directly here. Some of the, um, for new RTs, it's one of those that this is probably the most intimidating part is setting up the jet. Managing it is helpful and appropriate, but, um, I mean, not appropriate, excuse me, is you can work it through, but setting up the jet is a little intimidating, but just take it a step at a time. Um, set up one ventilator, then set up another, and then move from the ventilator out to the Y. That's just my trick when you're learning to set this up. My little tips and tricks. So... Um, we're going to go over settings and ranges, what you would set and why. Um, and because this is kind of hefty, we are doing this for both the high frequency jet ventilator and the conventional ventilator set into a non-invasive mode. Um, again, I'm a believer in take something that is overwhelming and break it down a little bit. So we have the high frequency jet ventilator. We just set four things. We set the PIP, the rate, the inspiratory time. Some people might call it a valve time. Whatever. Either one works, it's the same thing. And FiO2. On the conventional ventilator, most often you'll just set PEEP, flow, and FiO2. Um, we can set a side breath if it is indicated, which we'll go into that, which on that you just set the PIP rate and I time. Well, I go, that's a lot of things to set, but you got this. Um, the PIP. Typically, between 12 and 40 centimeters of water pressure, which is a big range, but depending on what's going on with your baby, um, depends. If I'm just setting it on a super premature kid that we're just worried about PIE, I might go a little bit lower. Um, like 20, 24 is strange. If I have a super sick kid that I cannot ventilate, being up in the 30s is I, I feel okay about that. I don't feel insanely stressed about it. Um, a lot of times you'll just kind of match or go around the same pips you were getting if you're moving from the conventional ventilator or the high frequency oscillatory ventilator to the jet ventilator if you need that trick. It's okay to go kind of around there and then adjust up and down as needed based on gases, um, visual assessment, and TCM readings. Um, we need to assess chest bounce, TCM readings, and blood gas when we're setting up our PIP. It won't go clear to the umbilicus. It'll be a little more subtle than on the high frequency oscillatory ventilator, but you'll still be able to visually see chest bounce. Um, tidal volume is 10 times smaller than the conventional, than conventional tidal volume. So they're itty bitty. They're teeny tiny. They're one tenth. Um, but because we are giving those smaller tidal volumes, it is, um, per Bunnell, it is safer to increase the high-frequency jet ventilator PIP, and it's more effective than increasing the PIP on a conventional ventilator. Um, because we risk barrel trauma, we risk insanely high peak pressures with increasing PIP on conventional ventilator, but because we have that passive exhalation, decrease, decrease risk of air trapping, um, the high Frequency jet ventilator is a lot safer to just increase your PIP. It, when in doubt and you can't get your CO2 managed, my new jerk reaction is going to PIP. Um, sometimes I'll go to rate, but most of the time I go to PIP. 
and I will up my pip before I touch my rate until I'm getting significantly higher. The range for respiratory rate is 240 to 420 breaths per minute. Um, the strategy I like to pick is um, the smaller the baby, the higher they tolerate rates. So the, a smaller baby, I would do 420. If maybe I have a big chonky meconium aspiration kit, I might go around 360. Um, if you decide to adjust the respiratory rate, you have to go by jumps of 20 to 40 to have any type of change. Um, this isn't like a, I'm going to go from 240 to 215. I mean, excuse me, 420 to 415. No, you need to do leaps of between 20 and 40 to actually have considerable differences um, with your respiratory rate. So how I talk about big bites and little bites with CO2 management. PIP, little changes make big bites. Respiratory rate, big bites make little changes. Um, eye time, 0.02 to 0.04 seconds. Most of the time I would do this for IDVE management and strategies. Say we do have a baby with PIE, I'd wanna make sure I have a fast eye time to allow for a longer expiratory time because we do have those saggy condom alveoli. Um, but inversely, maybe I have a kid that I just has cement for lungs. I can't recruit them. Their lungs are just insanely stiff. I might give a little bit longer eye time to allow myself longer to get those tidal, those pips in and to allow for recruitment. So there are strategies for both oxygenation and ventilation when it comes to eye time. Most of the time, you'll just keep it at 0.02. Um, it's very just dire situations or strategic situations you would adjust the eye time um and then even then it would be like 0 0.024 0 0.028 something like that that you would set so here is a picture of the jet let's break it down we're gonna go from the bottom to the top so down here i have the water this is the water that feeds into the high frequency jet cassette um, it's called the cassette. It literally looks like a cassette from like the 80s. It's great. Um, which feeds in water, which then goes up. This right here is the jet circuit and a secondary purge here that goes up to the flow interrupter, for which helped deliver this pip. Um, and this will literally, you'll sit it in close this and then this flap closes on top. Um, this water pump pinches here and will deliver water as needed. Excuse me. Um, this is the jet heater um, for this circuit. It will be set at 40 degrees, which you can go up and down here. Normally it's just set standard 40 degrees. Um, and you can silence because it will alarm. And then wait will just kind of pause this humidity that's um, flowing through for, say, I'm instilling um, inhaled nitric oxide or it's overheating for some reason. On button. It's important. Over here, from left to right, we have the PIP. So we have what your PIP is now. Um, so it says now and new. So let's say we need to make changes. We have where we're currently set, and then if we need to go up or down, we use these arrows, up, down, and then we press enter to select. The high frequency jet rate, this one's on the lower end, 240, but if we needed to go up, we have these arrows, and again, enter to set. This is the eye time, on time, or valve time, whichever one you'll hear, you'll hear all three. Um, 0.02, but say we needed to change it, we're having oxygenation issues up or down, and then press enter. And then we can see our I to E ratio right here for ventilation management. And that will change when you change rate and the eye time. Up here, we can see the monitoring and measurements. Um, 
our measured pip. Sometimes it will be a little bit lower. It was it doesn't always match up perfectly 30-30. So there will be some variability depending on what's going on with your baby. Um, our peep that is being measured and coming back to for reading, um, that will be also be a little bit lower than what you have set. But it's good to note it for in case there are any complications that can happen. We use the PEEP to manage our mean airway pressure. Remember, our mean airway pressure is our tried and true go-to friend for oxygenation. Um, right here is our delta P, our change in pressure between our PEEP and our PIP, which helps with, which affects our ventilation, just like with high-frequency oscillatory ventilation. This is your little mini tidal volume, your pressure. And then servo pressure, which we will get into here in just a couple slides. Um, but it is your driving pressure. And then most importantly, your silence button and that your ready indicator. Okay, moving on to the conventional ventilator. Um, say you are moving from the convention a conventional invasive ventilator to the jet or from the oscillator to the jet. You would set your PEEP two to four centimeters of water pressure below the mean airway pressure from those ventilators. You are trying to find that optimal PEEP for having those alveoli fully recruited but not affecting venous return or hyperexpanding the lungs. Um, Premature babies just plan on you probably are going to have hyperexpanded lungs. It's just the nature of it with the jet. Um, it is what it is. Um, typically, you would have a peep between 6 and 15 centimeters of water pressure, and this directly affects the mean airway pressure. For me, I like to start out around 7, 8, 9. Um, those are pretty safe bets and then adjust from there based on oxygenation and chest x-rays. So between seven, eight, and nine, those are safer areas to start. Um, our goal of the PEEP is to open up those alveoli, have the appropriate alveoli recruitment, and to keep them open so that we don't collapse and further cause um, damage to that hyaline membrane in the alveoli. Um, say we have our adding side breaths. So side breaths are, their 100% indication is for oxygenation and alveolar recruitment. Um, these, even though they are a breath and we're giving a rate and everything, they'll just have minimal, um, effect on ventilation. It, you might see some change, but it just won't be huge drastic changes. So we can either have it off our rate of zero, um, typically the rate is set between one and five if you decide to put it um, a side breath or backup rate on. You will place the PIP pressure because it will be a pressure, it will be the centimeters of water pressure. You'll have it set two below the jet PIP and this allows for appropriate recruitment um, but it won't cause the ventilator to freak out or cause hyper or it helps decrease risk of hyper expansion of the lungs. So set two below the jet. Um, your inspiratory time, because this is a low rate, sometimes you set a rate of two, sometimes you set a rate of one breath per minute, um, that you can have longer, slightly longer eye times. So 0.4 to one second, I think is a good range. Um, the lower the rate, the longer your eye time I give. And then you can provide interrupted or uninterrupted options. Um, I very rarely, if ever, have used interrupted, most of the time uninterrupted work appropriately. And I have a slide to kind of give you a visual of that. So, um, flow. The conventional ventilator, like the Draeger, sometimes it will have a manual inspiratory time along with our eye time. We want to make sure that this is set in a flow because this is a interrupted flow form of ventilation. So you have to unlock it. Grab your senior RT. They probably have the code written down somewhere for everybody to find. Um, play, unlock the vent, put it in the flow. And typically it will be between 6 to 10 liters per minute. Okay. So this time we're going to work from the top down. We can see here this 
Ventilator is set in a non-invasive mode where in C Fontini CPAP, non-invasive ventilation. Um, you can see the high frequency flow interruption here. And I use that as an indicator if maybe I am obstructed or something is weird. Um, this will just stop. But, and then you can see it. And then you can also see when breaths are delivered. Um, you'll get some readings over here. Most of the time, you just want to just check that the mean airway pressure is close to what you have set for your PEEP. Because you will be in that non-invasive and you won't get that continuous feedback of every value. FiO2, right there. Um, if we had a backup rate or some side breaths going on, this is where you would set your PIP. You have your PEEP for alveolar recruitment, and then flow right here. And then inspiratory time if we were had side breaths occurring. Which, remember, you'll have to put this into a CMV mode for that to happen. Okay. Interrupted versus uninterrupted. So, side breaths. These are for alveolar recruitment. Here's our PEEP that we have set. Um, we have our PIP that is set to below the jet PIP. Now we're going to come up and reach. And then we have our inspiratory time between that 0.4 and 1 second. Uninterrupted, we are continuing to give that high frequency ventilation while we give it, while we have that recruitment maneuver. Interrupted is, it will deliver that high frequency breath, and then same, same eye time, same PIP. It's just one continuous flow up and down. So that high frequency stops for an interrupted. Again, I very rarely will use it if ever most babies can tolerate uninterrupted that I have personally worked with. FiO2 changes. I know all of you at this point in your life know how to titrate FiO2. It is a very common thing in the NICU, especially when you have a kid with a freaking PDA, right? We've all been there. Um, one thing with the jet, though, is it has some difference, um, a little bit differences when you're adjusting the FiO2. So um, for proper FiO2 oxygenation titration, the conventional ventilator and the jet have to be matching on their FiO2. Um, if you change oxygenation on the Draeger, you have to change it on the jet. If you have changed the oxygen on the jet, you have to change it on the Draeger. 70% of oxygen titration comes from the jet, 30% from the conventional ventilator. So if you're doing this, simply all you have to do is, okay, I changed my FiO2 here. I have to change it on my blender and we'll have it attached right next to it. I change it on my blender going to my jet. So that's all you have to do. Change it here, change it here, change it here, change it here. Just make sure you're changing both of them. Because um, otherwise you're like, I don't even know how much I was giving if there is an emergent or a situation. Servo pressure. Um, so servo pressure is something specific to the high frequency jet ventilator. Um, it is an indicator of the driving power needed to provide ventilation. So essentially that is an objective value of how much power is being used to ventilate. Um, how much how much the ventilator is working to get air in. I'm trying to think of different ways to explain this to help different learners. Um, this is also great for tracking and measuring pulmonary compliance. Um, yeah, and I like to think of it as how much power do I need to fill up a certain space? So if we have decreased compliance, say all of a sudden the space we need to fill shrinks all of a sudden, our servo pressure will drop. Um, a mucus plug, severe atelectasis, respiratory distress syndrome. Um, but if we have increased compliance, all of a sudden we have all this space we need to fill up and we need all the driving power to fill up this space. We have a rise in our servo pressure. So that allows for alveolar recruitment. I mean, it's excuse me, say we have alveolar recruitment that's occurring. Um, maybe there's a leak in the circuit. Maybe we have a pneumothorax. Um, for example, there was one time I had a baby on the jet for a while and all of a sudden my servo like shot up to five out of nowhere. And 
it's because I had a leak where my flow interrupter box was. And that's why my servo was just, it was just trying to use driving power to fill up the whole wide, whole room because there was a leak in my circuit. Um, and I have visuals also for this. Um, typically we want this around two PSI, but it is patient dependent. I have some kids with just trash lungs that I'm happy to chill around three. I have some kids that are itty bitty preemies that I hang around 1.5. So it's finding what is normal for your baby, but typically around two PSI is around where we want to be. So here's our little examples. Okay, so it will be servo pressure PSI right here for your reading. So this one is 1.5. Sorry, that's kind of a crappy picture. My bad. The 1.9, excuse me, 1.9 is our servo pressure, so around 2. Um, here is our stable servo pressure. Here's some visuals. Um, it's constant. Um, it's the constant pressure we need for that driving power to ventilate these lungs. Let's say we're having worsening compliance or there's a giant mucus plug or something. Please forgive me for not being an art major, but see how this is a smaller alveoli than this one? Now we're going down in size. Worsening compliance and resistance, we have a drop in that servo pressure. So we have less space to fill. So I need less power to fill it up. So my servo is going to go down because I have less, less PSI needed to fill up this little space I need. All right. And then inversely, say we have improved compliance. Maybe we're finally opening up. Maybe we have a leak somewhere. Um, this is our bigger alveoli. See how we need more? We need more arrows to fill up the space. We need more power. We need more oomph to fill up where we need. That will cause a rise in our servo. So we have more space to fill up. So I need more servo. I have less place to fill up. I need less servo. Okay, equipment management. So initial setup, remember you have that specialized suction catheter um, and then perform the device check and the breathing circuit check on your conventional ventilator so that you're giving accurate flows and pressures. And then same with the high frequency jet ventilator. After you um, get some settings in, you'll use a little test lung, which is very, very, um, <laughs> Technical, we just cut a finger off of a glove and then we put it over our life port adapter to assess the function of our ventilator. Um, and then there's also a test button that you'll put just to test the function and the screen of the ventilator. Um, buttons and functions, we're going to go over enter, standby, and silence. So this is the shut up button. If it's alarming, you're like, okay, you're done. Um, this indicator right, light right here, essentially if we pause the ventilator for whatever reason, assessment, suction, anything like that, um, it will say it's pressurized and we're back to appropriate ventilation and everything when this is ready. So that will turn off after you put it in standby, turn back on once it's pressurized again. This enter button, is what selects any ventilator changes and also it starts up ventilation again um, is what starts the jet to work um, the standby button is what pauses ventilation um, so just as with the high frequency oscillator if we pause it it just stops the high frequency but we continue to hold that pressure that is maintaining our airways open we don't just take it all away so if we pause it maybe to suction or to listen we just press enter to continue on. And then during the initial setup, this is the little test button. My favorite thing is that it kind of looks a little bit like the flux capacitor when you're doing the test button. So you get to go back to the future. Just if you need that little reminder. Um, probably as much as this is one of my most favorite pieces of equipment. <laughs> um, the alarms drive me nutty and that's because every time you press the enter button it resets the alarms every time you press the enter button so if you make a ventilator change 
If you start it back up after pausing the ventilator, it always adjusts the alarms. So you have to reset them every time. So like if you have a big busy kid or something, you are const um, where maybe they have a ton of secretions, you're constantly adjusting those alarms. Um, it won't let you adjust the alarms until that ready indicator that I showed you guys in that top right corner. Um, it won't let you adjust the alarms until that says ready and it's indicated. Um, and we have that specialty suction catheter and you would just use same strategy. You would match the numbers on your suction catheter up with the one on your endotracheal tube. The jet has to be placed in a standby for suction maneuver or else it will cause the alarm to, I mean, excuse me, cause the ventilator to kind of freak out. And then um, you don't get as appropriate of suction. So, or if you're old school or in an emergency, if you apply suction on the way down the tube and the way out, you can have an effective suction maneuver. I didn't tell you that. You found that out in other places. Whoops. Um, <laughs> so we are combining two circuits. Again, that happens at the hub of the suction catheter. Um, we use humidity and heat in both conventional and the jet ventilators. And then we'll just review it because, again, I feel like... The majority of new RTs find setting up the jet to be the setup being overwhelming. Um, that's why I'm breaking it down for you. Um, both are connected at the specialty suction catheter and the life port adapter. So let's say we pause to suction or for the doctor to listen or whatever. It, you might so have. Here are your alarms. Once that ready light is lit up and we are stabilized and ready to go you'll just hold you'll use your you'll use two fingers super technical put one finger on the vent the alarm you want to set and then hold this and then the numbers will rise and same with lower limits and then the numbers will drop and that will set your alarm wherever you release off of this is don't overthink it i think 1980s tech everybody hold it Till you get the number you want, hold it till you get the number you want. Um, but yeah, it will lock you out if you try to adjust it before the ready light. It'll just be like, no, we're not ready for this. Um, again, our specialty suction catheter. Um, most commonly, it'll be in 6 French and 8 French for neonates. So make sure that you put the 6 French on your itty bitties and the 8 French on your biggie biggies. Um, equipment continued. We have our flow interrupter box that we saw pictures of. Um, make sure it is in a safe and secure location. You don't want this to get bumped or knocked because if it falls to the ground for whatever reason, your baby will immediately get extubated. Um, how we talked about, we move the rubber tubing on the flow interruption on the circuit to prevent leaks. Um, again, that's one of the times I've seen my servo just shoot up suddenly was a leak right there. Um, we want to keep it level. You don't want it to be leaning or adjusting in any way. And then have a cushion below for proper neurodevelopment. ET tube, you want to make sure it's in a neutral position. Um, you can flip the circuit back and forth. It just sometimes takes a little bit of practice. It's okay if you need a little bit of help with adjusting, just like with all other ventilator circuits it's glorified legos so there's a lot of turning and twisting and adjusting that can happen but it's absolutely appropriate to turn things so that you have that et tube in a safe place um because that's the last thing we want is for our endotracheal tube to come out um the suction catheter and the circuit are heavy and awkward i'll be the first to admit this especially when we have an itty bitty so just be careful. Um, I like to use a burp cloth to help position it where I want it to be. And then I um, also like little Velcro clips to t go around my circuit to help kind of position it and prevent any torquing or pulling that might happen on my endotracheal tube because that's my priority. I can replace anything on my ventilator. I can strip that thing down and put it back together however many times I need to, but I can't do that with that baby or that endotracheal tube. So that's your number one priority is your baby and your endotracheal tube. Um, so ventilator troubleshooting. 
Um, when in doubt, always look at your patient. Do we have a good bounce? Is our ET tube where it needs to be? Um, it, are they freaking out? Are they crying? Did they pull it out? We've all had the baby that's alligator flopped and all of a sudden you're like, well, I guess you're extubated. We've all been there. Um, <laughs> do you have secretions coming up the tube? Um, I always like to teach my students when you're assessing what is going wrong in a troubleshooting situation, move from your patient out. Because again, your patient is irreplaceable, your vent's replaceable. So you move from your baby, see what's going on. Do I have a good bounce? Is my tube in good position? Is my suction catheter pulled back where it needs to be? Um, and then moving on to a lost bounce. If we have a lost bounce, my first thing to do is check my ET tube, make sure it's in good position. Make sure that it's where I measured it, where it needs to be. Do I need to give a little bit of tension? Do I need to push it in just a tiny bit? Um, I do that without unsecuring my tube. I just kind of put a little tension on it. Do I need to suction? A lot of the times they just have a big old booger they need out of their lungs. Um, do we have a circuit leak or a disconnection? Where, what is causing this loss of bounce? Um, along with that, if you do surf, um, apply surfactant while a baby is on a jet, you can give surf with high frequency oscillatory ventilator because it will push it in. The jet will pull the surf out, so make sure you, if you are surfing a baby and then putting them back on the jet ventilator, make sure you instill it with the Neopuff and it is well um, distributed into the lungs before you put it on the jet. Keep that in mind. Um, one thing I've had, so this is the back of the jet. I've had people like ran their computers and stuff into this patient box. That's essentially what is delivering the electrical power and control. Um, and that causes my vent to malfunction. So make sure that's in a good, safe, protected location. That's just a things I've learned in my experience. Make sure it stays nice and secure. Um, one thing that is honestly the most annoying troubleshooting, but it is what it is, um, is that cassette will overheat on the jet sometimes, especially if it's for a baby that's, being, that's on the jet for a while. Um, it will sometimes overheat. So that wait button, I'll just let it cool down for a little bit. Sometimes that's all it needs is to be cooled down. Um, and then you can just start it back up. And if that doesn't just replace that cassette and that whole circuit, that whole circuit is all in one. You just have a friend um, bag for you while you replace the jet circuit and that should fix the problem. Um, you also would hold if we are incorporating inhaled nitric oxide because otherwise it will cause water to go into your circuit and then you could potentially like kind of lavage your baby and that's not good. Um, sudden servo changes. If we're trying to figure out what these sudden servo changes are, again, move from the patient to the ventilator, check for leaks, leaks kinks, and blocks. Um, there's a, again, on the circuit, there's a lot that could get pinched, that could get removed, that could fall off. Um, sometimes just like, something will be in a weird position. So trying to figure out what on your servo pressure is having issues. Okay, that's the end. I'm so sorry that this was a whole hour, but that is theory and equipment management of the high frequency jet ventilator. Um, again, I'm gonna, my special thanks are to Benel and the University of Utah newborn ICU. And of course to Artie. I want to say this is my bed, but it's her bed, and she sometimes lets me sleep in it. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions um, that are in my my group of people I wrote this for, um, feel free to call me, text me, email me, just grab me while at work or while in class, and we should be good. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you.